Hello, I'm Andy and uh, welcome back to Rust 101. This is the first proper video. Uh, there, the, the previous one was an intro. This is uh, like the first thing where we get into some stuff. Um, uh, this is going to be language basics, uh, you know, things like, like how do I how do I write the basic bits of programming? It's going to be the first half of what the, the course calls module A1. Uh, so thanks again to um, the developers of these, these slides. All the links are in the show notes. Uh, let's get started. Yeah, so um, this module is going to be just basic stuff, how, how to write code in the most simple way, uh, what it, you know, how to write a function, stuff like that. Um, so the, whole, the, the, the point of this whole module is uh, to, to get the, uh, the main ideas of like what, what a Rust program looks like, uh, and, then, uh, and to learn uh, syntax and operators, you know, just like uh, how you write numbers, how you, write, um, how you add them up, stuff like that. And then, and uh, not this video, but the next video, we'll talk about um, the ownership model, which is one of the really interesting different bits of Rust that we'll take some getting used to. Um, what experience do you have with Rust? Uh, let me know in the comments. Um, maybe we'll do some live streams at some point during this series, uh, and we can chat live. Uh, all right, here we go. Um, so we'll start off with a little bit of um, why would you even bother learning Rust? Um, then we'll do the, the Rust um, uh, basics. Uh, and then next video, we'll do the ownership model stuff. So let's start off um, with why would you learn Rust? So um, what the uh, course notes recommend is that uh, you watch this video by Florian Kilcher, um, who's like uh, someone that people might have heard of in the Rust community. Um, so I would recommend, recommend watching that video, but I'm not going to like put it on for you now. So I'll put the link in the show notes. Um, Definitely go off and watch that video. Uh, I, I just watched it. It's really interesting. Uh, it, it's completely different reasons from my reasons for uh, why I'm learning Rust and why you should learn Rust. Um, so really interesting, worth watching. I would say, uh, if someone asked me why should I learn Rust, I would say um, the reason why I really like Rust is it lets me express myself in ways that feel right to me. I, it gives me the... Um, the tools to describe um, types and uh, structures in a way that um, allows me to express what I mean, uh, but what uh, and also allows me to express um, constraints that make my code safe and uh, make me feel that the compiler is helping me write my code. Um, so when I've finished a bit of Rust code, I feel like, yeah, this, this is probably going to work, and I'm normally right about that. Uh, and that is a really great feeling. Also, it's got a load of other cool stuff about it, like... Um, compiles to machine code so you don't need to install um, some kind of runtime before you um, uh, before you give it to someone to run they, they can just run the executable uh, also the tools um, that it, that are provided um, with it for like managing libraries and dependencies uh, documentation all that stuff uh, testing uh, I really like the tools that you get with it so it it feels really really comfortable to me and that's an odd thing to say about rust because it's a really hard language to learn but all the way through, even the times when I've been frustrated by how hard it is to learn, um, I always felt like it was hard because it was teaching me something I really wanted to learn about. So um, it's a really satisfying process, even though it is really hard, and you should be ready for that if you're not. Um, there are going to be some difficult moments on your journey. All right, so basic syntax. Uh, let's create a new project. So uh, you can create a new project by... Um, in the last video, we talked about how to get hold of uh, Cargo. Um, so you should have Cargo on your computer now. Uh, if not, watch the previous video or just go to rustup.rs to find out how to install it. Once you've got Cargo installed, you should be able to type Cargo new and then hello-world. Um, and it'll make you a project called Hello World uh, in a directory. So then you can cd into the directory and you can do Cargo run and it will run. And we looked at this last time. Um, when you do that cargo run, um, it compiles your code. So it takes the uh, Rust source code that you've written uh, in a .rs file, compiles it, turns it into machine code that the computer can run, and then it runs that that compiled code, and then it says, hello world, um, because that's what the what your program says to do, and we'll have a look at that. But yeah, when you generate that program with cargo new, it makes a hello world program. Um, and if you're interested in where that um, executable file gets created, when you just say cargo run uh, or cargo build, it creates it in here in this. So it makes a directory called target and another directory called debug inside. And then inside there is this file hello world, um, which is uh, your compiled code, which it then runs. 
All right, so here's the program. Here's a program. So the program that got generated when you said um, cargo new basically looks like almost like the top bit of this, and we saw that last time. Um, so here's a program that we've written that's a little bit more complicated just to demonstrate um, how functions work and a few other bits and bobs. So let's start by looking at this top bit. Um, so uh, to make a function, you say fn and then the name of the function. And in particular, the main function uh, with that specific name, main, uh, is a special function because that's the function that's going to, where, where the program's going to start running um, when you compile it. So um, uh, naming it main like this gives it special powers, which means it's the first thing that's going to run. Um, and yeah, so this is a function called main. And then inside this function, the body of the function is just one line of code in this case. Um, and it uses the println macro. So um, uh, a macro, in this case at least, uh, a macro is a bit like a function for, um, from this point of view um, because you, you call it in a similar way by put, um, uh, putting round brackets after its name and passing it some stuff. Um, but println is a macro, not a function, which as far as you're concerned at this point, um, we'll get into what that really means. But for now, don't worry about it too much. It just means that you need to put an exclamation mark after its name. And then we're passing in two arguments to this uh, function. The first one is a string, which says hello world, uh, and then fib6 equals curly bracket, curly bracket. And so all of that is just a string. You can see because it's in, it's in double quotes. Um, and then, so that's the first argument that we're passing into println. And then the second argument is this fib6 here. So there's a fib6 here, but that's just part of the string. This fib6 here um, is, is code because uh, it's outside of these double quotes. Um, and fib6 is calling a function, and the function it's calling is this fib function, which we'll talk about in a second. So that first line of code is a macro. It is saying, call this macro called println. Uh, uh, and by call, I just mean ask it to do its thing, um, and then passing in those two arguments. And the um, we'll probably get into this in more detail, but the, the bracket bracket here um, just says substitute in the thing that you've passed in next. So when it when it runs, it's going to say fib6 equals, and then the answer for after um, from calling fib6 or calling the fib function with the number six. All right. So let's have a look at the fib function. So again, you say fn to say this is a function, um, uh, and then you give the name of the function, which is fib. Um, this is the, this function is called fib because it's calculating um, the mathematical um, function of uh, Fibonacci. Um, which is basically uh, a sequence. So you, you're passing in here like which number in the sequence you want. So the sequence goes like one, one, two, three, five, and so on. Like it's a sequence of numbers. And the rule for the sequence is um, you add up the, the the previous two numbers in the sequence to get the next number in the sequence. Uh, uh, none of that matters. The point is that uh, this is a function that does some kind of calculation and returns an answer. So um, we saw up here that we called fib and we passed in a number. So the way we've written that and when we're defining our function is we say, it's, we say the function's name and then in the brackets we say what, what arguments you're going to pass in. So what things are you going to pass in to fib? And in this case, it's just one argument and it's called n. So inside our code, we can refer to it as n. And then we have this colon and then the type. So in Rust, you have to say what... Um, what type of things are being passed into a function. You can't just say n and it could be anything. You have to say what type of thing it is. And the type of thing it is is u64, which means um, an integer, a number um, uh, that, is, uh, that is made up of 64 bits. So it could be a very, very large number. Um, and uh, in this case, uh, because it's the u there, it's, it's an unsigned integer. So it can't be negative. It can only be 0 or, or bigger. So that's this bit. We're saying when you call fib, you can pass in one thing, and that thing must be uh, an unsigned 64-bit integer. And then we have this arrow, and then we have the return type of this function. So that tells us when fib, when fib returns, when it's finished its work, it gives us back another u64, so another integer. So it's in summary, fib is a function that takes in a number, an integer, and returns an integer. Um, so let's have a look at the inside of fib. So 
The inside of fib is just one if statement. It's got an if part and an else part. And we'll look again in more detail about exactly how these work. Notice that you don't have to put any brackets around the condition part, the bit after the if. Um, but you do have to put curly brackets around your bits of code. So what we're saying is, if n is less than or equal to 1, just return n, return the thing we were given. Otherwise, um, return this, this whole expression. Um, and it, this is interesting, right? Because if you haven't seen recursive functions before, this is going to look pretty weird. But yeah, from inside the fib function, we call the fib function twice. So um, the first time you see this, it's incredibly confusing. And the best advice about what to do about it is just go with it. Um, uh, so that, but the, the fact that this function is recursive isn't really what we're talking about here. We're just talking about like um, what a function is, how you write a function, how you call a function. Um, so yeah, if, if n is 1 or 0, then just return n as the answer. Um, if, uh, if not, then you return the result of calling fib again with a number 1 less, and then adding to it, calling fib again with a number 2 less. Um, so that's the definition of Fibonacci. I said it, it's the, it, the next number in the sequence take, you get by adding up the previous two. So you'll notice here that there's no return statement. So the rule with um, in Rust is uh, if you don't have a semicolon at the end of the line, then the, this thing is an expression, and the last expression um, in a function is the return value. So you can actually return earlier than that by using the return keyword, but on your last line of code, um, you don't say return, you just um, write an expression and that's what gets returned. And that's kind of inspired by some other languages. Uh, it's really nice when you get used to it. It feels a bit weird right now, probably, if you haven't seen it before. Um, so, and then what's particularly weird about this function is it, it is all only one line of code in some sense. That, the whole if-else block is like one logical line of code. Um, and the two halves of the block both give you different val different values. They're different expressions that give you values. Um, so we don't need we don't have any semicolons, any return statements here. We're just saying this whole thing is what we return, and then inside each bit of the if uh, that this thing that I'm telling you here is the thing we return. Um, this will become clear later. I promise you. Uh, well, actually, I shouldn't promise you anything, but um, I I think it will become clear. So yeah, these these two options are the things that that get returned from this function. Um, the fact that fib's calling itself, don't worry about it. Um, fundamentally, it's doing an if, and on either side of the if um, is an expression that is um, getting calculated and then returned. And we'll talk more about all, all that stuff, about um, exactly how returning and stuff works. Um, but yeah, notice that the if itself is an expression, and we'll get onto that too. All right, so that was um, that's the whole program. So let's look at what happens when we compile it. Um, so uh, again, it looks similar to how we what we saw on the last slide. Uh, you get some when you say um, cargo run, which is what this is the output of. Um, you get some output, and then the last line is what the program actually printed. And you can see it says fib of six is eight. So it is true. The sixth sequence. Whoops. The sixth sequence in the fib, the sixth number in the Fibonacci sequence is eight. So it did work. Um, yeah. If you're worried about um, recursion going on forever. Uh, that won't happen here because when we call fib, we always call it with a smaller number than what we were given. So eventually we're going to get down to this case where um, uh, where n is, is 1 or less um, so that we can stop. OK, uh, so that was that was basically like how do you write a function. So now let's do uh, what happens with variables. And we're going to take start off with an example that doesn't quite work to demonstrate something to you. Um, but yeah, variables and function names tend to be given snake case names. So that means all lowercase with underscores between them. So we can see on line two here, um, the variable sum underscore x is being created uh, with that with a snake case name. And uh, it, it, we're putting the value 5 into it. So this is how you uh, set up a variable in Rust. You say let, which means I'm setting up a variable, similar to how fun means um, I'm writing a function. Let means I'm um, giving a name to a, a value. Uh, uh, and then you say equals, and then on the right-hand side, you say uh, the, the value. And at this point, you can give the type, but you don't have to. And Rust will work out the type if you um, if you don't give it to it. So in this case, we didn't need to give it the type. Uh, now, what's going on here, which may not be obvious, is that if you write um, a variable like this, it's immutable. That means it can't change. Um, 
And that's the default way that variables get created in Rust. So that might be surprising to you because the name variable sounds very much like they should be able to vary. Uh, you might also ask, why? Why would you not be able to change something? What's the, even the use of um, giving a name to something that, that then doesn't change? And the answer is, is like, comes from quite a lot of years of experience in, of us dealing with um, programs um, in, uh, in the world. And a lot of people, including me, think that this is actually a really good default to say, by default, things don't change, and we have to explicitly say if I want them to change. Um, the reason is it's just less complicated because um, you, both you and the computer know exactly what that variable value is at all times um, if you know that it never changes. And uh, it sounds surprising that that would be any use at all, but it honestly is. All right, so, um, uh, so that was uh, setting up a variable on line two. Uh, uh, but if we actually run this program, uh, there's actually a bug in it, like I said. Uh, and the compiler gives us quite a lot of information about what the bug is. So line two is fine. We set up a variable, we put the number five into it. The problem is with line four, where we try to change what value is inside that variable. Um, and because um, this variable is immutable, can't change, you're not allowed to do line four. You're not allowed to change it from five to six. And the, the compiler is telling us, uh, look, here's our first, the first time we assigned to some x was up here. Um, and then on line four, we tried to assign again to it, but it's immutable. Uh, so what it says is consider making it mutable by typing sum, but mute sum x. Um, so what does that look like? Well, it looks like this. We put in this mute, which stands for mutable, which just means it can change. Um, once we've done that, um, we started it out as five, but then later on line four, we can change it to be six. So, um, so some programs you just need, well, some ways of writing code, you just need some variables to be changeable. I would encourage you, um, before you you make all your variables mutable, just in case, to think, no, I'm going to try out, try and write my code without any mutable variables, see how it goes. Sometimes you end up with better code, believe me. All right, so when we do cargo run um, with that code, the, the program works. It prints out... So the, on line three, we print out sum x when x, sum x is five, and then later on, sum x becomes six, and then we print it out again. So we get these two lines printed out at the bottom there. Okay, so that was um, variables are immutable by default, or they don't change by default. You have to say mute if you want them to change. So what else? Um, well, I already mentioned some. in some cases, you can give the type of a variable. You remember we gave the type of the arguments to the fib function? We said it was a, a U64. Um, well, you can also say the types of variables. So, like I said, you don't have to because the compiler will often work out for you what type it is. But in some situations, either you just want to, you want to be explicit about what type it is, um, or you sometimes you need to. The compiler can't work it out. So, in all cases, with all variables, uh, the, the variable does have a well-defined type, a definite type. The compiler knows exactly what type it is. It's just sometimes we don't say that. So that's really different from some languages where um, uh, variables have a dynamic type, which means um, the there's no compiler that knows what type this variable is. It just happens to have a number in it at this moment and maybe a string in it later. Um, I'm thinking of languages like Python, for example. Um, in Rust, if you make a variable, it definitely has a type, even if you didn't say what it was. Um, but often we don't have to say. Um, but we can be explicit. Uh, and and uh, sometimes you need this, but sometimes it's a useful tool for debugging. If you're Sometimes I'm dealing with a great long line of code, and I get really confused about what's going on in the middle of it. And what I'll often do is I'll break it up into two parts, and in the first chunk I will say what the type is of my little variable that I've broken it up into. And I'm often wrong about it, and, I, and the compiler says, no, that's not the type. And then I figure out why, why my code is wrong. So um, declaring these types can be quite a useful tool for figuring out how your code works. Um, often we leave them out because it, it feels like extra noise. Um, but uh, potentially more often than, like, it also sometimes makes you feel clever to leave them out because you found a neat way of not having to type that. And I would sometimes suggest maybe resist that and include the type don't try and look clever. Just try and make your code as easy to understand as possible. Sometimes putting the type in 
uh, makes it easy to understand. So in this case, you might know that someone's going to be reading your code and not know that uh, um, Rust by default will choose I32 as the um, the default type of a number if you just write 20. Uh, so in that case, you want to communicate to that person who's reading your code, this is going to be an I32. Uh, well, why not write it down like this? And then you know for sure the compiler will tell you if you got it wrong. Uh, and you'll be communicating well. And obviously, writing code is mostly about communicating to humans and slightly about telling the computer what to do. All right, so let's talk a bit more about types. So you've seen a couple of types, haven't you? You've seen I32, which is here, and you've seen U64. But let's look at, look at all the different types of integer numbers um, you can have in Rust. Is this all of them? I don't know. Anyway, uh, some of the most commonly used ones, at the very least. Um, so basically, you say how much memory your types are going to take up. They could, they could just take up 8 bits or 16 bits or 32 bits, 64 or 128, or they could be the size of a pointer, which is basically um, dependent on what uh, machine architecture your program is compiling on. So generally, you want to be explicit about what type uh, something is. So um, you know, often a company, a default choice would be an, an I32 or a U32. If you know that it's never going to be negative, you might use a U32. Um, or if you just want a number and it could be quite big, then you should probably go for U64 or I64. Um, if you know it's going to be really big, maybe the 128 version. Um, and generally, you should avoid saying U size or I size because those could be different depending where you're compiling. Um, so I say that you should you should generally avoid them. On the other hand, you are going to encounter uh, U size and I size fairly often because quite a lot of the the uh, standard library code that you're using is going to end up using U size. For example, if you're looking for, um, if you want to say this item in a list, uh, often you're going to be providing a U size to say this item in a list because um, the kind of natural maximum size of a list um, is going to be that pointer size based on your computer architecture. So you are going to encounter U size more than you might potentially like to in your code. But where you've got a choice, um, then definitely try and use a size that is like definitely you know exactly what it is that way your program will be predictable it will always work the same on everyone's computer um, all right so that was the types so these are the things you put after the colon so now let's think about how you would actually write a number of that type um, without without putting the colon in so you, in, in all these cases you could have well in some of these cases you could put a colon um, uh, after your variable name and it would declare the type but if you just want to write a, a 42 but you want it to be a u64 what you do is write 42 and then u64 immediately at the end of your number and then it knows that uh, that y should be a u64 the default is that uh, like in the case where we didn't do that is that x is an i32 also z is an i32 because in this case we haven't written a type here we've just said we've just put an underscore in you can put underscores anywhere inside your numbers um, just to break up the digits. Um, I would encourage you, under normal circumstances, to group them the same way we tend to write them um, when we're writing on a piece of paper. Uh, we put commas. Um, you can't put commas in Rust, but you can put these underscores, which, which helps split up. So that is every three, every three digits, starting from the right. There are situations where um, there's a particular number format that you're using um, where grouping in threes isn't the best, isn't the clearest thing to do. So you can put them anywhere. Those underscores can just go anywhere inside your number. Um, but I would encourage you normally to group them in threes. Otherwise, your readers are going to be really confused. Other things you can do to make a, an integer, uh, you can use hexadecimal by doing 0x and then um, the hexadecimal value, and that will come out as that's just a normal number. In, ter in, ter in terms of the, what the, how the computer thinks, u is still just an i32, exactly the same. Um, but you've been able to write it in a way that's clearer for you to understand if hexadecimal is your bag. Um, also, you can write octal by doing 0, O, or binary. Um, now, if you don't know what hexadecimal or octal are, don't worry too much. Um, uh, maybe you know what binary is. So you can say 0, B, and then you can just give a whole load of zeros and 1s, and that would be a binary value. And if you're doing certain things with binary numbers, or like you're doing some stuff with, I don't know, UTF-8 or something, where like how it looks in binary is quite helpful for understanding what it is, um, you can you can write numbers in binary. Again, W is still just an I32 here. It's just that you wrote it down in your code in a way that's helpful. Uh, and another thing just worth mentioning here, we'll get onto characters in a second, um, but if you want just the um, like the number the number that represents an A in ASCII, you can just do B and then this 
a like that um, and that that's stored as a, a u8 so it's only eight bits um, so that is a different type these are these ones are all i32s but q here is a u8 all right so that was how you say the types of variables and how you say the values you can store in variables when they're integers so now let's look at floating point numbers so floating point numbers as in fractions decimals um, uh, a bit simpler you can say the two types you can use are f32 or f64 um, so those would be the thing after the colon that's saying where you're saying what the type is um, uh, and that could that would be a number like that well, that means it uses 32 bits um, and exactly how that uh, floating point number stuff works I'm not going to talk about but um, that means that there's a certain range of numbers that can be represented um, from very big to very small um, and uh, obviously F64 can support a wider range and more detailed range near zero. Um, if you want to, yeah, so by default, floating point numbers are F64s. Interesting, because the default integer is an I32. Um, if you want to use an F32 instead, you just write F32 at the end of it, similar to how we did with integers. So that's how you get decimal numbers. Um, uh, and then how do you combine them together to do stuff where well, you can do various numerical operations, um, so you can add them up, you can take them away, you can multiply them with the star, you can divide them. Um, note, by the way, that when you're uh, doing any of these things, the two things on either side need to be the same type as each other. Um, and in particular, if you divide two integers like this, the answer will be an integer. So it will get rounded, like it says here. The answer will be 3. Um, you've also got the percent operator to find, to find the remainder in integers. Um, and then, yeah, so we should talk a little bit about debug versus release. So um, when, you, when you're just compiling your code, running it, um, doing stuff in your, um, in your development cycle, um, your code will get compiled in what's called debug mode, which has various things about it that make it easier to work with. One of those things is um, that these expressions will do overflow or underflow checking. So that means if you multiply together two big numbers and the answer is too big to fit in a U32 anymore, when, it, when they were U32, the answer is a U32, but it's too big, then in debug it will tell you that that went wrong. I think it will crash your program and tell you, I'm not sure. Um, similarly, if, if a number becomes negative when it's supposed to be unsigned, then it will tell you. But when you compile your code in release mode, which is super optimized, ready for actual production use, um, like, but it's basically when you're building it to give to someone else, um, then uh, it won't warn you about that. It will wrap around. So if you if you if if an unsigned number became negative, um, it will just become really big positive number. So the idea of that is that you catch all the bugs in debug, so that you uh, don't have to check for it in release because it's quite slow to check for that stuff. So that's why we don't do that in release builds. Um, you can also, and we'll see at some point, I hope. Um, how you can actually be explicit and say, I don't want it to um, wrap around. I want it to um, give me a, a, an error I can handle instead, um, stuff like that. So we'll, um, like Rust lets you do all kinds of stuff like that, but these we're just talking the default behavior here, which is that it'll give you an error when you're, when you're developing your code, and then it will just um, ignore it and wrap around when you, uh, in a release version. That, that's the compromise that they've chosen, but you can pick a different compromise if you want. Yeah, and as I said, you can't mix up different types of number here. So you can't even add a U32 to a U64. You have to explicitly convert things to the right type, and then you can uh, add them up. And that means that it's always absolutely clear what's going to happen. You might think this might be a little bit annoying, and sometimes I guess it can be. Um, but it does mean you're being absolutely explicit. I'm adding up two U64s here. So if the number is too big to fit into a U32, I'm fine. Uh, and similarly, um, you can't divide a floating point number by an integer. Um, first of all, you've got to convert that integer to a floating point, and then you know the answer is going to be a floating point. Um, so there's not the, the kind of implicit rules that you find in some languages that can get very confusing and have surprising results. Um, okay, um, other so we've done um, integers, we've done floating point numbers, um, we've done combining um, numbers. Um, so now we've got like yeses or nos, um, booleans. Um, and that uh, a boolean, you, you declare that something's a boolean by saying col colon bool, and then it could be either true or false. So yes here is true, no is false, uh, and then you can not things. So if you say uh, exclamation mark before the thing, uh, that means 
the opposite. So uh, no contains false, so therefore not is going to contain true because that's the opposite of false. You can also combine them together with logical operations by saying ampersand ampersand or pipe pipe. So ampersand ampersand means it, this this thing will only be true if both of the things I'm giving you on either side of the ampersands are true. So in this case and is therefore going to be false because only one of these things is, is true. Uh, and then or is if either of these is true then uh, uh, then the answer is true, so all will be true because one of those is true, isn't it? Um, what was I going to say about those? Um, yeah, also those um, uh, those short circuits. So if you get um, if you get to a point where you already know the answer, just when you're at this point in the in the code, it won't ever bother looking at this this bit of the code. Now you don't have to care about that with the in this case because the, this doesn't really do any work when it's looking at these yeses or nos. But if you can imagine on the, either side of this these pipes there were some function calls that did actual work. Um, if we get a true back here, we don't need to bother doing the work for the other side, so we won't do it. Um, okay, um, so it's, uh, that only, obviously it only stops if it knows the answer. So in, in that case, um, it would know the answer if it got a true, but it wouldn't know the answer if it got a false, so it would continue to do the rest of the expression. Okay, uh, if, that, if that didn't make any sense to you, don't worry about it. That, um, you can come back to that later. All right, so you can also compare things. So if we've got two numbers here, we can ask, uh, is x less than y or greater than y or less than or equal? We can also ask, is x equal to y, which uses equal, equal? And you can also ask, is it not equal to y, which is exclamation mark equal? Um, and again, you can't compare things that are not the same type. You need to convert them to the right type first, which you can do. Um, okay. Uh, all right, so now we get on to some of the interesting bits. So numbers it probably work approximately how you expected them to. Um, uh, certainly when I first came to Rust, characters and strings did not work the way um, I expected them to. So we'll spend a little bit of time uh, talking about this. Uh, I would encourage you also, um, don't try and get your head around it immediately. Um, it probably is going to take a bit of time, um, but you, it will gradually work through. And we'll do examples that will help you get there. And if you do the exercises on the course, that will help you get there too. So let's first of all talk about characters. So characters are not the same thing as strings. Uh, so if you've used a language where single quotes and double quotes are both used for strings, that's not what Rust does. Rust uses single quotes for characters and double quotes for strings. And the strings and characters are completely different. So characters are just um, underneath. They're just a 32-bit number. So um, if you know anything about Unicode, Unicode is essentially um, a list of all, let's say, all the possible characters. Now, obviously, that's, um, that's a lofty goal. But for, for the purposes of what we're talking about, um, Unicode is a list of all the possible characters. And each of those uh, characters or code points um, or Unicode scalar values, um, all those numbers fit into, into 32 bits. So they, 32 bits is enough to cover all the possible characters you might want to talk about. Um, and so one 32-bit number is is enough to hold on to any character or any code point. Some, some things that humans would call characters are made up by combining together multiple code points. But this character type, which is called written char in, uh, in Rust, um, uh, only deals with a single code point, a single Unicode scalar value. So uh, uh, in this case, so for example, if you if you put in uh, single quote Z to single quote, then this thing C here will be a char, and that char inside it will have like the the whatever the Unicode number for Z is, which happens to be the same as the ASCII uh, code for Z in this case. Uh, and then for this, this special uh, Z character, um, it will be some other 32 bit number that gets put, that gets held underneath in Z, but the type of Z is char, so you don't have to worry about what the actual number is uh, unless you want to. Uh, and then also, this heart eyed cat is also um, a single character, a single Unicode code point. So, heart eyed, this heart eyed cat variable has this, the, that number inside it. So, a char is just a 32 bit number, but it looks different to you and gets printed out differently, but underneath. So, the thing to know about that is. Uh, it's not the same. Chars are not stored in the same way that they're stored inside strings. Inside strings, um, which we'll get to, they're not 32-bit numbers for each character. They're different size. So let's get on to that. So here is a string example of a string. So yeah, by the way, I should just say, um, 
your Rust programs can contain weird characters like this. Um, the Rust programs are stored as UTF-8, which is a, a way of encoding Unicode. So Unicode characters, as in all the characters you might want in practice, um, are allowed inside your Rust code. Now, in a lot of places, they might not be. It might not be a good idea to use them, but inside strings and characters like this is definitely a sensible place to use them. So here's an example of creating a string. So that was a, what we just looked at was an example of creating a single character, a char object. Uh, now we're going to create a string. So strings are much more complicated than chars. Chars are just a 32-bit number. Strings um, are um, well, we're going to talk about ownership and stuff like that in the next video. So I won't get into that, but strings are like a piece of owned memory on the heap. And again, that word will make more sense after the next video. Um, and then we also have, as well as strings, so we're creating a thing which is of type string here by calling a function called string colon colon new. And we'll talk about, like, this structure looks weird, right? But for now, just know that this is the way you create a string object. And we pass in as an argument to that, that constructor, um, this thing here, which is a string literal, which is not the same thing as a string. Like in a lot of languages, th these things are the same, but in Rust, they're not the same. This is a string literal, which is written ampersand str. And we'll get into why there's an ampersand. You know, we'll get into this. But as I said, these are, it's surprisingly complicated. But once you get your head around it, there's good reasons for all this stuff, and it really makes sense. But yeah. The, I think the key thing for you to realize right now is that this letter H here in hello, that's not stored as a 32-bit number, right? Well, I mean, that, that is a choice that Rust could have made. It could have said all strings are represented in what's called UTF-32, which means that every single character takes up 32 bits. Um, but Rust did not make that choice. Uh, it kind of wastes a lot of space if you do that. Uh, instead, strings in Rust are represented in memory when your program runs as UTF-8 uh, things. So what UTF-8 is, is a way of encoding Unicode so that the different characters take up different space. So this H, I happen to know, only takes up one byte, and so does this E. Uh, and then when we get to this um, planet symbol, that will almost certainly take up four bytes, um, but certainly more than one. Um, and the way UTF-8 works is, um, you know, one byte, one byte, one byte, and then it get, and basically it knows. Let's not talk about exactly how UTF-8 works, but the uh, your program is able to know um, that uh, able to understand those bytes as it finds them and understand. Oh, this is a, this byte means that this, there's going to be a few more bytes. So, um, so I haven't finished this character yet. Uh, anyway, I'm I'm getting into how UTF-8 works, but um, the. They're stored in memory as UTF-8, and what the specific thing that means is that it's not straightforward to jump to a certain place in the string because you don't know how many bytes the other characters of the string took up. So if I said um, I want the third character in this string, well, I could find the third byte, and it would happen in this case to be the third character. But if I went on to like fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, if I asked for like the ninth byte, that would be a byte that's kind of halfway through this planet. So that's not an actual character. It's like a little bit of a character. So you can't index into strings like you can in some languages. Um, by index, I just mean you can't say, give me the third character in a straightforward way. You, there is a way of getting out the third character, by the way. Um, but it's not just a straightforward, give me this bit of, uh, give me the thing that's three bytes in. You have to, um, you have to kind of acknowledge the fact that uh, you have to walk through the characters in order to find the, the eighth character in this string. Um, yeah, so as, it, as the last bullet point says, um, there are different types of strings. And the, key, the, key, the two key types you need to think about uh, for now are a string literal, as in what, when we actually write something in double quotes, uh, and then a so-called string with a capital S, which is a thing that like owns a piece of memory that, that is a string that could change in size. Um, and we will we'll talk about this a lot because it's complicated and you might be thinking, my goodness, why is it so complicated? And the answer is to do with the fact that Rust is really explicit about who owns what and exactly what what is in memory. And that is does make life complicated, but it also it's really cool. Uh, it means we can write incredibly efficient programs, but also programs that are really clear about exactly what is happening, um, which means that they... Uh, we have we have control uh, and we don't have to hand off control to something else that we don't know whether we can rely on it or not. 
with being very clear exactly what to do. All of that is probably sounds like complete fluff, but hopefully if you keep going, um, we'll get to um, why it's a really good thing. Um, note the other thing to know is that in memory, in strings, in Rust, there's not a zero at the end. So in a lot of languages, writing stuff in quotes like this would implicitly add like a zero byte at the end to say the end, this is the end of the string. So Rust doesn't work like that. Rust um, remembers the beginning and the end positions of the string, so that's equivalent. What that means, it, which is really cool, is that you can refer to like a substring of this string without copying the memory anywhere else. You can say, oh, I just want the LLO part. Uh, and you can have another thing that refers to the same bit of memory safely um, by just having a different start and end point. So that's pretty cool. Uh, anyway, uh, that won't affect you in daily life using Rust unless you really get into the weeds. All right, so uh, let's look at another type of thing. So we've looked at numbers, we've looked at booleans, we've looked at strings and characters. Now let's look at tuples. So you might have seen this in, in a similar thing like this in some other languages. So you can write, in order to make a tuple, you can say open bracket and then some stuff with commas separating it and then close bracket. So this is not calling a function or anything like that. that. This is just saying group together these three things into a so-called tuple. Um, and because it's Rust, the type of things is really well defined. So you can also say what the what the type of that tuple is, which is basically this is a tuple of an I32, an F32, and a char. Um, and you don't have to. Again, it can the compiler can work out that that's what you meant in this case. Um, but you can be very explicit about um, uh, what you've got here. Um, this is just it's really useful for just imagine you just need to return two things from a function. You might want to group them together like this into a tuple. Uh, often, by the way, you should think about whether you can be clearer about what they really are by making a little struct to hold them in or something like that. We'll get onto structs. Um, but sometimes you just want to group some things together. Um, you can do it like this. Uh, things to notice about, uh, notice about tuples, this is not a, a list that's growable or something like that, um, or in, in Rust, what's called a vec. Um, this is a fixed size thing, and and unlike uh, with a vec or an array, um, the types of those things that you've grouped together can be different. Um, like we had here, we've got an i32, f32, and a char. They're not all the same type as each other. Um, and yeah, but they don't. It doesn't grow. It's not for. It's not for storing um, a collection of things that might uh, uh, grow. You can, you can do that, but not with tuples. Um, and uh, yeah, this is just for like holding some things together. All right, so let's look at how we would use this stuff. So we, we make a tuple similar to what we did here, uh, which is uh, an integer, a floating point, and a, a character. Uh, and then look what we can do here. We can do this so-called destructuring thing. Um, so what, what, what that means is um, you say on the left-hand side you put things with brackets, round, and commas. And this it turns out let, the, the whole let thing is a lot more powerful than I've shown you so far. Um, because if you give a pattern on the left like this, like saying, I'm expecting to get a tuple that is this shape, then it, it knows that the, the right-hand side should be that shape, and it will give you an error if it's not that shape. But in this case, it is that shape, right? It's made out of three things. So uh, A gets to be 1, B gets to be 2.0, and C gets to be Z, just as you would expect. And now we've got these three variables. Basically, that statement created those three variables by destructuring uh, the tuple, and now you can print them out, which is what we do here. Um, and then here's another example of how to get stuff out. So that's one way to get stuff out of a tuple by destructuring like that. Another way is, is kind of a more straightforward way. Imagine we've got a tuple which just has true and 42 in it. Then um, you want to print out the 42. What we do is we say the name of the variable and then a dot and then a one um, or a, a dot and a zero to get the first thing out or so on. So that syntax looked very weird to me when I first saw it. but. Um, it's unambiguous, there's nothing else you could be doing after the dot here, so um, it actually works. So yeah, if you've got a tuple, you can get the second thing out by saying dot one, or the first thing out by saying dot zero, or the third thing out by saying dot two. Yes, the numbering does start at zero, um, like in lots of other places in programming, and that takes some getting used to if you're not used to it. Um, what else? Yeah, so this destructuring, we've shown a kind of a simple example where this pattern exactly matches this pattern, but you can actually use this to do really complicated, um, interesting stuff where you can grab stuff out of the middle of a variable, so we'll get to that at some point. 
Uh, what else? Okay, so I said that tuples are not for storing lists of things that are all the same type. Um, and they're also not for storing things things that could change size. Well, arrays also can't change size. They're a fixed size. Um, but arrays are for storing a list of things that are all the same type and in, very, in a very memory efficient way. So um, uh, this we're creating an array here which has three things in it, one, two, and three. So they're all I32s. They have to be all the same type. Uh, and then we're saying what the type of this. So this has got square brackets instead of round brackets to say we're making an array. Um, and then the type is an I32 semicolon three, in, all in square brackets. So basically we're saying uh, this is an array of three I32s. Um, and we can print, print one of those things out by asking for the first thing in it by saying the name of the variable and then brackets zero. So this is similar to how you would have used um, lists or vectors in lots of languages. You can also destructure arrays. Uh, similar to how we destructured the tuple, you can use the square brackets here to say, get me out the three things in this array, A, B, and C, um, and they will get put into these variables, A, B, and C. So notice that, this, that, that only works because this, uh, this thing is a fixed size. Uh, so arrays are not resizable things. That's a vec which we'll get to. Arrays are just um, exactly this number of integers or exactly this number of um, strings or, whatever, or characters or whatever. Um, yeah, um, so they're all the same type, always a fixed length, just like a tuple is. Square brackets instead of round brackets, you can destructure them. Uh, and if you look things up in an array like this with this with a number, um, uh, Rust will always check and never let you uh, access something that's outside of the array. It'll crash instead. So you've got to be careful. Um, yeah. OK, um, so that's arrays. There's, there's another way of writing arrays, which is instead of saying 1, 2, 3 here, you could have said 1, semicolon 20, and that would have given you 20 number ones in an array. All right, so that was a load of different types of stuff. So now let's talk about how you, how you uh, structure your code and how you uh, make things happen differently depending what's in a variable or something like that. So that's called control flow. Uh, so here's a, here's a function. Um, just, a, just a main function, but it's got a load of chunks in it, uh, three different types of control flow. So the first one we're going to look at is a loop. A loop it goes on forever. So you say loop and then curly brackets, and then it goes on forever. Hopefully it doesn't really go on forever. The reason why it doesn't really go on forever is because inside of here we've got an if, and inside of here one of the options in the if is break. So break means stop looping. And um, if you read this code carefully enough, you'll hopefully conclude that eventually we will get to the break and not go on forever. Uh, so that was a, 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 a loop. Um, and that's the kind of most basic uh, type of um, looping structure in Rust. Uh, and it's used a little bit more often than it is in some other languages. Some languages really frown on, on like infinite loops um, because there's always the possibility you might get stuck in there forever, right? Um, uh, and there's also the possibility when you use a while loop that you might get stuck inside there. And uh, maybe slightly less because it's a slightly easier to understand structure. But basically a while loop says, um, check this condition. And if it's, if it's true, then run the stuff inside. Otherwise, stop running. And you'll, again, hopefully convince yourself by looking at this uh, code. Eventually, we will um, get out of this while loop because y is going to become uh, zero, in which case we stop. Uh, so those are two types of looping where you have to kind of manually read the code to understand whether they're going to finish. Uh, a for loop is much simpler. Um, a for loop is always going to finish because it's just going to run once for every time around the loop. Uh, and basically you say, um, make i be one the first time around the loop. So it's going to print out i colon one. And then the next time around the loop, it's going to be two. The next time around the loop, it's going to be three, four, five. And the stuff you can have here, at this, at this point, we've made an array. Um, but you can loop through anything that you can iterate, and we'll talk about iterators a bit later. Um, by the way, in both while loops and for loops, you can also use break to, to stop early. All right, so that was um, the different types of loops you can have. Um, uh, let's also talk about how functions work in slightly more detail. So yeah, as we saw before, uh, functions always start with uh, fun and then the name of the function and then in brackets the arguments that you take um, and then after that the the type of thing that you return so notice that you always have to give the types of your arguments and the type that you're returning 
um, you know, Rust, like in some languages, um, they use the kind of this type inference coolness to mean that you don't even have to specify this stuff when you're defining a function. Rust makes a compromise there, which is that it will the compiler will often work out what you meant for for types in lots of places, but not um, when you're declaring a function. You have to be explicit about it. And actually, that sounds like maybe the compiler is being lazy, not doing as much work as it could. But actually, I feel like it's a really good compromise there. A, a it makes me much clearer when I'm reading a function. It helps me understand um, what's going on. Um, but B, uh, it's also really good for um, helping your um, editor uh, be able to like autocomplete code and stuff. Because it doesn't have to go and compile the entire program just to be able to understand this bit of code and very quickly... Um, give you like type hints saying, well, you can't add a, a number to a string, so what are you doing? Um, without having to compile the whole program first. So I actually think it's a really nice compromise um, to to always make you give the all the types in that function declaration. Sometimes it's difficult if the types are very complicated, um, but I think it's worth the compromise. So yeah, but you've also already seen functions that don't have this this arrow saying what type they return. So for example, this function here. Uh, and that's because if you don't put the arrow, then Rust fills in something that looks a bit like this, saying you return um, what, what in other languages might be called void, as in I don't return anything. Um, in Rust, it's called unit. Um, yeah, so what do these notes say? Yeah, so the boundary always has to have types. Inside the function, uh, the compiler will infer the types for you if you want them to. Um, as I said, um, returning unit means I don't return anything, and by default we return unit. And yeah, a, a function, the, what a function is, is a set of statements, as in things that return unit, things that, that where we don't care about what they're returning. And then the last thing is an expression. Notice again, we use snake case, as in all lowercase with underscores, to separate words. Why do we do that? Just because it's easier to read than anything else, in my opinion, and in lots of other people's opinion. Um, yeah. That's all we've got for functions. So yeah, fun name, arguments, return type, and then the body of the function, always with curly brackets around it. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So we talked a little bit about statements. So statements are things that don't return anything. Um, they just do something. Um, so definitions like let blah is a statement, but almost everything else in Rust is an expression. And we already saw that if is an expression. Uh, which is really cool. Um, in some languages, you might be used to doing using the um, the ternary operator, which is a question mark colon thing, so that you can do an expression that's a bit like uh, an if statement. Uh, in Rust, if is a, an expression already, so you can just say if kind of inline in your code. Uh, if blah, then uh, if blah else blah, and you'll get back a value in either case. So it can be an expression. Um, all right. So examples of statements, things that have semicolons at the end. Uh, including lets, which always have a semicolon at the end. But you're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to treat let blah as if it was an expression that's going to give you a value back. It doesn't give you a value back. You can't do that. Um, some languages you can. It can be useful, but it's really confusing. And any case in Rust where you would want to do that, like in a while loop, there's actually another structure you can use that lets you do that, and we'll get onto that. Okay, so that was statements. Statements are things that don't return anything. So expressions are basically things that do give you a, a value as their result. Um, most Rust code is an expression. Uh, if and while, oh yeah, while is an expression as well. It's really cool, really useful sometimes. Um, um, and also, there's another type of expression you can have, which is essentially just curly bracket and then a curly bracket at the end. So if you've got a whole load of complicated code that you want to run, but in the end, all you want back is a number that you want to put into Y here, well, you can just group all that stuff together in these curly brackets, and then the last line gets evaluated, and that's kind of the return type, and not really, but like the value of this this curly bracketed expression, so that gets put into Y. So Y here will be 4 when it prints out. So you don't often need to do that. Quite often you would just, this would just be a function. You just call a function um, and put the answer into Y. But if you want to do it in a block like this, you can. Um, all right. Uh, okay. What else have we got? So um, we've already looked a little bit at like a bit of control flow stuff, but here's ifs. Um, uh, what is this saying? Uh, yeah. So you can, as we said, a 
uh, uh, the function can end with an expression, um, but it needs to be both sides need to be the right type. So any kind of block like this, uh, like an if here, this if here is an expression, and the answer gets put into x. So you're saying if y is less than 10, then put 42 into x, otherwise put 24 into x. Now we know that y is, is uh, greater than 10, so, tw so x will end up being 24 in this case. Um, if these two things were different types, that would be a problem. So yeah, what's interesting here is that this expression um, up to this curly bracket is what gets put into x, and now it becomes a statement because we've got a let and then a semicolon at the end. So there's an expression inside a statement here. I guess that, that's always the case. Um, you can also use if just as a statement. So um, if you just want to print this or this, that's fine. And in this case, um, it's the last line of the function, but the function returns unit, so it doesn't matter whether there's a semicolon or not at the end there. Because an expression that ends with a semicolon returns unit, but also, um, uh, yeah, and, and the function expects you to re return unit, so it's fine. Okay, we've done all that. So, all right. So, um, this is kind of the last little bit for this lecture because next time we're going to get on to memory management. Um, so, I'm probably going to go over this scope stuff at the beginning of the next video, but we'll we'll cover it here first. So, uh, one a thing about Rust that we need to learn, and this will take time to get your head around if you haven't done it before, is that uh, you need to be thinking about the memory that's being used um, that your variables are pointing to more than you do in some other languages. Now Rust gives you lots of really powerful tools so that even though you're thinking about it you don't have to manually look after it and if you make a mistake it all goes wrong. Rust does your back um, and will tell you when you're getting it wrong but often to understand what it's telling you you need to think about what's going on underneath. So the first thing to know about what's going on underneath is that um, there's this concept called scope which is that um, the memory that you're using lives um, just within the curly brackets that you've created it within. So here's a beginning curly bracket, here's an end curly bracket, and then inside there's this thing called name, which refers to uh, this thing, which is um, which is held somewhere in memory. And the point is, at the end of that scope is when that memory gets cleaned up. Um, so. Um, yeah, so name, obviously name didn't exist before you, you did this stuff, but then name is now kind of visible until you get to the end of this scope. And at that point, um, not only is the memory cleaned up, um, in this case the, the, the memory is kind of not the important thing, the, the important thing is that this name is only visible from here until it stops being visible at that curly bracket. Um, so that is the, just the concept of the scope of a variable. Um, and uh, where you have allocated memory, um, then that memory gets cleaned up when you get to the end of the scope. So different variables have different scopes. So here, for example, i is in this scope, and it, it, it goes out of scope when you get to this curly bracket, but j got created inside this curly bracket, so j gets cleaned up uh, here. So you can't use j after this point, but also the memory that j was using to hold this number um, has been cleaned up after this point. Um, and for numbers, that's not very important, right? It's only one, uh, you know, only four bytes or whatever. Um, but when, when you're holding on to something complicated, not only is it could it be a lot of memory, but also some code might run when it gets cleaned up. And sometimes that's really important because maybe that um, uh, closes a file um, or closes a network socket or something like that. You can have code that runs um, when you get to the end of that scope that's really important. And it's really nice in Rust that you know exactly when that kind of cleanup code is going to happen. Uh, and this isn't just kind of left for some time in the future, we hope. And also, you don't have to remember to call the cleanup function um, because there's no way of kind of escaping out of these curly brackets without that code getting called. So that's a short introduction to scope. Um, essentially, a variable lives between the curly brackets that it's, um, it's declared inside, uh, and that is strongly linked to memory. And next video, we're going to talk about memory. We're going to really get into um, these things called the stack and the heap. Uh, I'll try and explain, uh, and to some extent, what they mean inside the computer, but mostly what they're going to mean for your code, how you should think about things so that you start to get your head around how Rust thinks about the world. and um, once you've got your head around those, the stack and the heap and how uh, and how how we think about memory, you're starting to do your journey into 
um, thinking the way Rust thinks, which you're going to need to do to be successful learning Rust. Um, and it's a process, takes a long time, um, but we will get there. All right, so uh, leave comments below, especially if there's stuff you didn't understand or things you'd like me to do differently in this series. Um, uh, I know we've covered a lot of stuff. We've, we've like um, shot through a whole load of just information for you that I sort of dumped on you. Um, but I'll put a link to the exercises. You can try out the exercises for this module. That will help you get your head around things. But also do ask questions. Um, if I do live streams, do come along to the live streams and ask me things. And we'll get there. Um, I probably didn't explain things brilliantly. Um, if you're feeling intimidated, I think that's an appropriate feeling. Like there are some things in Rust that are hard to get your head around, but we're going to try and work through them. Um, and you can do it. And uh, by you, I don't mean some complete genius. I mean some ordinary person. Um, if you take the time, you think things through, uh, watch the video again, watch someone else's video, um, you will get there. Um, these things can be understood. It's just that they're not going to immediately click in the way that um, you might have found with some other language because um, Rust, Rust has some like difficult ideas in it, but they're worth learning because it's awesome. All right, uh, enough waffling. Uh, thanks for watching. Um, subscribe and all that, and uh, see you next time.